Well, thanks everybody for uh, for coming out to this. Um, we've been very excited about this uh, this legislation and campaign to expand the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument in this area because it's always been kind of a special place for us, right on the on the border of the existing monument. Um, but our intention to expand uh, and now is the time that we're finding the uh, momentum to do so. It's an amazing zone. Um, Bob can really talk about the, the geology and, and a lot of the plant communities and uh, as can Glenn Holstein, uh, particularly about the plants. Uh, for me, the interest has been kind of the geography of it, the, the amazing um, sets of natural springs that you find within this, within this um, ridge, as well as the views and the vistas of the monument proper as well as a lot of the uh, ancestral indigenous history of this area, really as, as in addition to being a, a real spiritual place, uh, the fact that there are so many paths to travel and routes across this ridge um, going up and down between Clear Lake and Indian Valley to Bear Valley, where Highway 20 is at present was a main travel route. Um, as well as up Benmore Canyon, which goes up toward Indian Valley to where the dam is, um, and connections up and over the top of uh, Cold Spring Mountain and down the other side. Uh, these were main uh, trading routes between different tribes and tribalets within this whole region. And that kind of history for me is really fascinating, particularly when you go out there and see the diversity of um, the natural resources that tribes would have been able to draw from, from both uh, medicinal plants and edible plants, uh, pine nuts, acorns, even places like that tucked within little coves and canyons surrounded by a sea of chaparral. There's just a lot of really nuanced diversity in the landscape out here. So I've been really excited that we are finally working toward getting this piece added to the, to the monument. Bob, did you want to talk a little about uh, some of the geology up there that's gotten you really excited and me excited when I'm out there with you? Yeah, I've been having a lot of fun on Condor Ridge a lot recently, and it's um, it's uh, from a geologic perspective, it's it's one of the most interesting places I think in the world. And Elders Moores used to say, if you want to see plate tectonics, this is where you see it. And and with uh, Peter Schiffman and Judy Moores, starting with Elders Moores too, and, and Mark Hofshevsky, we did the on 128 from Winters to Pope Valley. But what was really interesting, I think, when I got up to Walker Ridge, I'm going, whoa, this is a lot more interesting and complex. So there's three main rock types up there. The bottom one's called Franciscan, and it's a melange and assemblage, basically, of different rock types that get stirred up in the in the trench before being subducted and brought back up to the surface. So that's the lower plate. And then on along much of the ridge, you have a big one or two mile thick serpent or serpentinite. Uh, and some an earlier uh, tours call it the Wilbur Springs serpentinite, but uh, the more modern folks these days are calling it the Tehama Calusa serpentinite melange. So that's just kind of geology speak. But um, and then on top of that is the Great Valley Group. And you see that in a lot of places around here. You see it when you drive up like past Monticello Dam or along the cliff areas of, of Cache Creek as you go up the canyon. And that's the sandstone shale layers that were deposited as carried down and like earthquakes setting loose this, this delta of sediments that go down from you know a couple hundred feet to like three or 5,000 feet into the trench and spread out and the sand settles out first and then this, the shale and silts on top of that. So those are three main types, but then you have subduction, which is where one plate is, to, is, is sliding under another plate. Usually that's the ocean crust because it's, it's, it's more dense than the, than the continental plate. Then it turns out there's another thrust fault, the Stony Creek fault. And then it's all been, it's got a couple transform faults that slide by each other. And those are basically part of the San Andreas transform fault zone. So they're, they're parallel, essentially parallel and take some of the strain that San Andreas fault 
takes as as uh, the as Los Angeles continues to move towards San Francisco at a slow pace. I don't know, it's two or three or five centimeters a year. <laughs> um, but the other things I'm learning very recently, there are two types of serpentinite in this area. And one is this big sheet emplacement of, of what was Ocean Crest serpentinite on top of Condor Ridge. And there's also a detrital serpentite that came out of a large mud volcano in the trench. And the reason they know this is they see this happening in the Mariana Trench. And you could go see that, but you'd have to have a submarine. Um, then uh, it's hard to tell jokes, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks. So. I, I do appreciate it, Bob. <laughs> yeah, but but this, so there's, I, I never even knew about this and I've walked right by it basically. And you just, it's like a five mile round trip to hike down to the center of what is this uh, ancestral mud volcano where there's basically serpentinite that's oozing up through faults and weakness in the crust to the surface and then spreading out. And as that's happening, these turbidite currents bring all these sediments down. So you have a, a, maybe a turbidite layer or three, and then on top of that, more serpentinite, and then another layer of Great Valley sequence. So that's all interbedded. So that's a million year story. And then right on the north end of the ridge, we, Peter Schiffman, who's a real geologist, he's a professor emeritus at Davis, pointed out a rock called metalliferous chert. And there's another type of sort of activity in the ocean is these black smokers that you've probably read about. that are sort of the basis of life, perhaps, in a lot of ways. And so they're always bringing stuff up and this is like metal sulfide. So there's iron, and platinum or gold or mercury that are all coming out of this black smoker and it spreads out and settles on the floor. And meanwhile, all these radiolar and shirts are raining down from the top of the ocean onto the floor. And then this gets, this gets mixed and it gets, uh, it gets compressed. And the next thing you know, it's brought back to the surface and that's metalliferous chert. So it's a very, it's an amazing place to, to walk and feel that geology there. So I'll stop there, Andrew. You push the on button, but I'm going to try <laughs> to stop for a bit. Thank you. Any questions you, people can just ask too. Well, David, maybe you know, give us a status update on kind of where we are with the legislation to do the expansion. Yeah. First, I'll just say it's great to be with all of you, and um, you know, I think for for all the reasons that both of you just described, the importance, all the values of this place. This is why you protect places through designation of national monument. And that's why the original monument was created. That's why we want to expand it. And the, the bill that um, Mr. Garamendi and Mr. Thompson introduced a number of months ago, uh, in effect does four things. It expands the map. It actually you know, creates a new map for what the monument would look like. It calls for management of the expanded monument in line with the original monument proclamation from 2015. And it calls on the interior secretary to enter into cooperative and collaborative agreements with relevant tribes who care about the land. Um, and then it formally renames Walker Ridge to Condor Ridge or Moloch Loyuk. And so actually in the spectrum of legislation that I deal with, it's a very simple bill, which is uh, better than you know some bills I deal with that are hundreds of pages. But um, the bill in the house that Mr. Garamendi is leading almost immediately after it was introduced, got a hearing in the House Natural Resources Committee. And um, it was a, a very positive hearing in terms of the testimony, not only from Mr. Garamendi um, and tribal support, but the representative from the Bureau of Land Management who was participating in the hearing endorsed the bill, which is a, a very positive thing and is not something that always happens. So I think that was uh, a positive surprise. Um, and as most of you probably know from Tuliomi's communications, the Senate version of the bill that uh, Senator Padilla is leading and Senator Feinstein is co-leading uh, was just introduced. And there's potentially an avenue for that bill to get a hearing on the Senate side. But um, if, if any of you pay attention to what's happening in DC, you probably know there's a, a tremendous amount of gridlock in the legislative process. And so one of the things that I, deal with in working with groups like Tuliomi that 
uh, Conservation Lands Foundation supports throughout the West who want to see places protected is there's basically a two track approach to achieving the protections that we want to see. And one is the legislative path and it's having a viable bill like the bill that we have that can advance as far as possible in a legislative process. And if, if there is an opportunity to pass a bill as you should through the House and the Senate to the president's desk, we will want to do that and we'll move that as far as we can. But if, if that doesn't happen for various political or logistical reasons within how Congress functions, all of that work serves the other possible path, which is the Antiquities Act. And of course, the, mon the original monument was created in this way. Um, my communication with the administration is that they understand that they may have to declare national monuments through the Antiquities Act. They want to see Congress hopefully do its job. Mm -hmm. um, they probably are realistic about that end game as well. But the, they want to be able to see community-based support for protecting a place, or in this case, expanding protection for a place, uh, which is evident right here. They want to know that the tribes that care about a particular place are very invested and involved uh, and not, not in an artificial way, but in a real way, which I think I can also say is the case with this monument. Um, and they want to know that elected officials who have a stake in the place are invested. And, you know, Tuliomi has been part, a significant part of making sure that the congressional delegation uh, is invested in this. And so all of the elements are there, I think, so that even if the bills don't move any further in the process than they have, there's been, you know, all, all the elements are there for the administration to take a look at this and say, there's a reason for us to use the Antiquities Act to expand this monument. And the one last thing I'll say is that the historic um, appointment of Deb Holland as Secretary of the Interior uh, has, I mean, I could speak for a day about all of the meaning behind that, but I think the, the, the meaning behind this monument expansion and what it means for the Yochidehi Winton Nation these are the types of narratives that directly appeal to the secretary in what she hopes to achieve as interior secretary. It's not only protecting lands that are important to tribes, but supporting the joint management, the co-management of a place, as well as the collective uh, opportunity for tribes and other people in the community to recognize the value of a place and restore its protection for the ongoing future. And so um, this, along with others, uh, other campaigns that I've been working on that have that same interaction with tribes seem to be the ones that are most uh, interesting to her. And I have a feeling, you know, she'll be able to impart that upon the president who ultimately makes the decision about these things. But um, I think this campaign is, is in an optimal place to hopefully um, reach the end game sooner than later in whichever path is most viable. Thank you, gentlemen. I want to. Um, I'm. I'm. Want to thank everybody. I want folks to know we also have another board member on the phone, Glenn Holstein, Dr. Glenn Holstein. He's a botanist. Um, one of the really special aspects of this place is its um, biodiversity. Both the um, I think over thirty rare plants, and then we also have the um, the critters out there in the wildlife pathways. And hopefully, we'll talk more about that also. Um, I do want to just because I'm the moderator rater and I um, get the ability to do this. I would love, um, we've talked about the co-management in the Yochadihi. Um, I would love if one of the panelists could talk about the historic nature of the co-management provision in this legislation. Well, I'll start that um, discussion because, you know, 3,925 3, acres is a critical strategic piece. But, you know, that's not, and it's important for wildlife connectivity and it's important for, you know, contributing to 30 by 30 protection of landscapes. But the bill just took a whole different turn in importance, I think, uh, when, and Sandy, you kind of led the way on engagement with Yochadahi, the tribe, thank you. And, and when they decided 
to, to give us a name for what they were going to call this area. And then when the chair of the tribe, Anthony Roberts, testified at the House hearings, and he just became excited also, I think, in that process. Um, th this is, I think, a model for much of California. The, uh, the, the, it took a while to craft the language for the co-management with the tribe because it hadn't been done in California. And, and so the, what is going on, what's happened here with the group of people that are working on this, the organizations that have come together, Conservation Lands Foundation, the Wilderness, or the, the well, the Wilderness Society, the, the California, um, or Cal Wild, um, the Defenders of Wildlife that involved, uh, a lot of this was led by the California Native Plant Society which I really appreciated because they haven't been as strong advocates in some ways, and now they're leading the way in a number of different areas. And I think um, that's a big step for them. And, it, and Nick Jensen has done a great job for them. So I've enjoyed that. And, and I know, Sandy, you wanted me to just mention about the, the biology or the, the plants and on the, on the range, and I can't do that because Glenn's on. And <laughs> I always try and check out if there's any geologists or botanists or other experts on before I start spouting off. So, But um, basically, the geology does provide the lead for often in this area, the types of plants we have. And one of the reasons that we have a lot of biological diversity in the region and in this area in particular is because of the geology with the serpentinite soils, which are very high in iron and magnesium and quite low in potassium and nitrogen. So some plants have evolved to only grow on serpentinite. Some plants um, can't grow on serpentinite, but also this is in the, the meshing of an overlap of ecological areas of the Klamath Siskiyou, the Central Valley Bay Area, all in this region. So there's lots of reasons for that. And it, and it also is particularly important because of its north-south orientation in terms of wildlife connectivity uh, in this region. And it's mostly public land, so we can protect that connectivity and you can't always do that with private land. So that's another really important aspect. And I'll come back if you want and, and, and try and mention a little bit about uh, wind power and the ridge. And, and I'll try and channel Nick Jensen if, if you want that later, Sandy. And you know, Sandy, without um, getting into the specificity of which plants where, uh, what I find is really interesting is exactly what Bob is talking about, that mix of both um, the geology and the sort of latitude of where these plants uh, exist on a north-south uh, trajectory. And so when you're out there, because there's such a um, mixture of the geology in such a relatively short distance north-south, you find a lot of these patches of different kinds of habitat in different locations. I mean, I'm talking areas where you might be a glade that's 200 square feet, right, of a particular type of plant community because the soil is just a little different in that zone. And that's what makes it so exciting when you're up there botanizing or looking at the geology is there's so much diversity in such a small zone. that You can literally stand in a place in some spots and be like, Oh, I'm looking at this plant community here and this one here and this one here and not even having to move around but seeing all of that in such a small area. Um, not that these other wonderful areas in California aren't so wonderful but uh, but the idea that it's so compacted in such a small area to be able to see that much diversity. So it's, it's really special when you go up there and visit these places because you stumble across them as you're sort of traversing the landscape. And we've had areas where you find like wet meadows right next to the driest outcroppings you can imagine. And that kind of diversity and all of that edge that that creates where you have plants, communities that are kind of moving in between some of these zones creates a really unique environment that you just don't find in a lot of other places. I don't, Glenn, did you want to, to jump in on some of this? You can unmute yourself and... Sorry, Glenn, you're, you're muted there. You're going to have to... <laughs> I think you're on mute is going to be like the, I got the buzz it. phrase of the last two years. <laughs> but yeah, that's actually a very good description because we have uh, geological diversity, like Bob talked about, you talked about the plant diversity, and uh, 
one of the things about this Mediterranean climate that we have where we get the uh, uh, most of the rain when it's cooler and uh, plants grow faster when days are longer and it's warmer means that the uh, precipitation that uh, falls in the cool season is stored uh, until the uh, area warms up, the climate warms up later in, in the uh, year during uh, late spring and early summer. And because of that storage, the uh, places it's stored, the geology, the soils, the kind of uh, incredible uh, geological diversity that Bob described where we've had uh, areas that uh, were uh, basically pushed up against uh, North America by plate tectonics, bringing things to the surface that uh, don't exist anywhere else uh, in any common form uh, elsewhere in North America. We have something pretty special because these plants uh, are dealing in, especially with serpentine, with uh, a mineralogy and uh, a combination of uh, uh, minerals that are different than uh, almost anywhere else because the earth's crust is rich in calcium. Well, these uh, serpentine soils have less calcium and more magnesium. And as a result, uh, plants that can get there are uh, able to not have to deal with the uh, common weeds that are invading mm -hmm. much of the rest of California. They have a, a place to themselves and they can flourish on these serpentine areas, which are essentially ecological islands. You know, we have a lot of diversity on our channel islands off the Southern California coast, surrounded by water. But here with these serpentine islands, they're surrounded by a different kind of crustal rock that is more widespread and they're unique. So each one of these big serpentine outcrops as we have on the ridge is uh, so unique. It's an ecological island and very, very significant. Also the uh, metal, a metalliferous chert that Bob was talking about, uh, those metals are something that are not found uh, in most parts of uh, North America anywhere. And that also makes a unique environment uh, for plants as well. And uh, one of the things that I've been leading trips up uh, to this area now for several years, and I've noticed uh, it's not only a matter of uh, plants being diverse in space, but they're also diverse in time. Yeah. Because <laughs> Every year, I see plants that I haven't seen the last uh, few years. For example, uh, this spring, right along the uh, very early part of the road up to uh, Condor Ridge, there was uh, Alls Harmonia, one of the most endangered species in California. And there it was right on the roadside. I've been by that same spot on the roadside many years, and it's never been there before. This year it was there. And uh, just... Uh, it's not just because the geology is different. Every uh, year we have a different pattern of rainfall. Like this was a very unusual year because we had this uh, huge atmospheric river that came early in October. Mm -hmm. and everything stopped. And then we got some uh, uh, little uh, showers later on. So plants have uh, you know, not been used to this particular weather pattern before. So plants that uh, weren't present before are there this year to be to be seen. So uh, all of the roads are show the kind of diversity you mentioned, Andrew. It's very, very spectacular. And so it's not only scientifically spectacular, but it's also aesthetically spectacular too. Some of those beautiful landscapes in the world are right there uh, where we can reach them. And I'd, I'd like to see this uh, area added very much to the existing national monument that uh, Tuliomi worked on and maybe even uh, the uh, Bear Creek unit of BLM to the south too, if uh, uh, eventually we might be able to add that as well, because that's an area that uh, Ellen Dean of uh, UC Davis described as a place where rare plants are common. Now it's different than the ridge, but it's uh, because the geology is different, but in its own way, very, very- That's where, the, that's where the serpent and I, or the, or the mud volcano is also is on that. <laughs> You have to say historic because it makes me think I'm going to go like soak for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sandra, excuse me, glad I didn't interrupt, but I, okay. do you want me to talk just briefly about the wind power? Or? Well, let's, let's, why don't we give the, um, I, I think we've got a like really great overview of how wonderful the place is. I mean, we've got this amazing piece of legislation. We've got great progress on it. 
we are going to get it out of the house who knows if the senate will let us get past to their log jam that they've had for god knows how long and may have forever but we have another path does um I, I want to hear about the wind energy, but I want to give our participants an opportunity to like have a, a idea. conversation and a discussion with you, right? Because it's unusual that we get these these small salon opportunities to have an actual conversation. So does anybody want to ask any questions or? Yep, go on about wind energy then, Bob. <laughs> All righty, well. Games, I know there's lots of curious people on this call that should be There's asking. been like, we, we all support renewable energy. You know, I mean, that isn't a question, but siting is important. And, you know, they would have to practically flatten the ridge in order to do this. They need 75 foot of space to pull all the big stuff for the turbines up there. And this isn't, this isn't a wind farm. This is an industrial wind development project. Um, it's very marginal energy. The state's maps say it's low to moderate. Um, there's bats in the area. There's there's birds in the area, bald eagles and osprey and golden eagles. Uh, and, and I wanted to mention, I think because of all the wildflowers that Glenn talks about, there's like 108 species of damsel and dragonflies in, in the state. And you can find half of them in that area, uh, the ridge and Bear Valley. So. And which points out when we talk about Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, I often just say Berryessa Snow Mountain region because the monument can only be federal lands, but the importance for ecological diversity and wildlife connectivity uh, includes a lot more land than that. Um, there's probably 500,000 acres in this region that are, that are to some degree protected. So anyway, I was wait, uh, there was like the, we were dealing with this fifth wind development project that, it, that had come to the ridge and the others had gone away. And I'm sitting in the shower one day saying, how come I keep having to fight with all these wind development companies? And, and that's when Ryan decided, oh, we'll make, this, we'll, we'll make this a bill and add this, take that legislative route. So that's, Ryan really made that, he's with Cal Wild, made that happen. And we've all been working really hard on that. But the, the, the thing about the wind is, again, you know, when it blows, it blows too hard also often, and then it's not blowing hard enough, or they want to turn it on right away, the turbines, but that's when the bats are out uh, before there's enough wind to blow all the bugs away. So, you know, the, you need a high turbine turn, uh, cut in speed and that isn't happening. Um, so it's just, it turns out not to be a location. That's why the first three or four companies left. And the last company, Algonquin, didn't perform. And in the hearing, or just on Friday before the Tuesday hearing, the BLM said that they had revoked and denied Algonquin the trespass permit uh, because of non-performance largely. And they hadn't provided the information requested by the BLM. And I don't think they'd funded their, their, uh, the people doing their NEPA work. So. The, their permit was denied. So right now there is no proposal. And I think it's a really good time for us to, uh, to, to step up and, and help make this happen and get these lands protected permanently. So thank you. It is, you know, Bob, one of those things where it's uh, been a bit of a frustration. And I think you've kind of echoed that of having multiple companies come in in an area that's marginal and because all of their data is proprietary, other companies don't see it. So then they come in and start the process, put up anemometers, gather the data, realize it's not viable, then they leave <laughs> and the next one comes in. And so it creates this uh, distraction, if you will, for a conservation minded group where you're trying to um, preserve an area, but there's always this threat out there, right? That, that keeps happening again and again, and you're expending your time trying to educate the new company as to the values of this area that they're going to have to investigate, because many of these companies are from out of state or out of country uh, and don't really understand it other than it's listed as, oh, there might be wind here, right? And so this will actually put the site uh, future at rest in the way that it should be, meaning preserved. 
and sort of get off the treadmill of, of having these companies pursue something that really isn't viable. We'd want, like you said, siting is important. We'd want them to put wind energy where wind energy can be generated without the kind of environmental impact that you would have in this area. Uh, so the uh, companies are kind of wasting their resources really uh, to pursue this. The best course of action for this ridge is for conservation. David, I see. Yeah, I just- Craig has a hand up. Yeah, Craig too, okay. yes. Yeah, I just wanted to Question. quickly comment that I, I think another thing for us to keep in mind about what we're working to accomplish here is that it is setting an example uh, and a model for other places in the West about um, not only as Bob said, properly citing renewable energy on public lands, but also how you know the potential for co-management between federal land management agencies and tribes, that will lead to better management of the lands because we all know that tribes know the land better than we ever will. Um, and certainly <laughs> better than uh, with all respect to them, federal land managers that don't have the resources to do the work they already need to do. Um, so I think, you know, beyond the value of protecting this place, which is critically important, it, it can become a model for how other places in the West can be both protected for conservation and done in partnership with tribes to make sure the land is, is managed as it should be. Yeah, it, it emphasizes the point that this is land that everybody's wanted protected ever, even before anybody ever thought of doing wind energy on it. But it's just one of those threats because it hasn't been properly protected, it keeps facing. The bill does not include Calusa County for the reasons that you just stated. So if, if the monument was expanded through the legislation, then it would be the map that the legislation has articulated. If, right. the, if the process ended through another Antiquities Act proclamation, um, the administration is not necessarily bound to the map that the bill has. It, it could just take what Mr. Garamendi has and make a proclamation out of that. Or if they had a desire to go beyond that or smaller theoretically, like that they have the the choice to make that uh, decision. And, you know, I guess I would say there are different levels of politics around a member of Congress who represents that area drafting a bill that includes a county that doesn't want to be involved and uh, a, a president of the United States declaring it. So that's all to say there's always a chance that a expanded, pro a expanded monument through Antiquities Act could look different than the bill. I do think it's important to po point out that all of the land we're talking about is already public lands. Yeah. We're not talking about touching any private lands. This is all already BLM lands. So the property we're talking about adding would be current BLM lands. It would be just transferring the management status of it. We're not taking private lands. So it's taking it from just BLM lands sitting out there and putting it into the monument, which means it'll be part of the monument management plan, which will be a landscape management plan by both agencies. It's in, their management plans are old. Forest Service is a 1995 plan. BLM is 2006. Think of everything we've learned. I mean, I think I had a flip phone back in, 1995 right you guys so, phones. right yeah so we want to up to bring walker ridge this really precious unique spot for all of its natural and geological and cultural resources within that planning process also and, and that also stops right at calusa county line right it, the legislation it, does but blm's property goes into calusa county Mm -hmm. And when in 2015, when Obama's administration was looking at the designation of the National Monument, um, the, the Forest Service actually said, no, we're not going to split up Snow Mountain Wilderness. We're going to include the whole of Snow Mountain Wilderness in the National Monument. And that's what, even though we hadn't included that in any of the work we'd done, that is what the uh, National Monument uh, um, proclamation did in effect was include all of the snow mountain wilderness so maybe the BLM would perhaps decide they wanted to I mean, we can't manage Walker Ridge in two ways we have to include the whole thing so it is up to the administration at that point in time 
Uh, and the, the bill that's currently in the House and the Senate says the expanded monument should have a management plan in line with the original proclamation. So it would be managed the same way. Yeah. One of the things um, we didn't mention, Bob, but has always been fascinating for me about the whole ridge is the amount of and, and abundance of um, natural springs along the whole of the ridge, not just in the expansion area, but uh, which includes a number of them, particularly on Cold Spring Mountain on the on the west side. But the uh, both the quantity and diversity of the type of water, and and maybe you know about that, you know, or, or can talk about that from a geologic standpoint, because for the rest of the audience uh, here, when I talk about diversity of of water resources. They've got these just crystal clear, wonderful springs you can drink out of to mineral springs that uh, are high in things like lithium, um, to springs that are um, sulfur springs, to carbonated saline springs where I've actually taken the water in my hand and put it on my tongue and you can feel the bubbling of the carbonation and the very high salinity all within, again, very close proximity to each other. Um, and, and I've never come across another place, and I've gone to quite a few, particularly like in the Sierra, where most of the springs tend to be you know, just really cold, cool water springs, um, to have something of this diversity of different water types in such a small area. Bob, what, what's kind of the, the basis? Does that come back to the plate tectonics? That well, gives us here's a map one map that I have of, <laughs> of the ridge. Um, and all that purple is serpentinite and all this green is Franciscan rock and this blue down here at the bottom is Great Valley Group rocks. And so you've got all these faults and weaknesses in the crust and there's a lot of water. A lot of these rocks are like formed in the ocean. So they're mixed with water. And then when they get compressed during subduction, Sometimes that water gets squeezed out towards the surface and it goes up all these and it's still being compressed and it's still being squeezed. So that stuff migrates up to the and out all these springs. So everywhere there's a weakness in the crust with all that water and the sediments or rocks, you're, you're getting in the some of it might be near serpentine and some of it might be Great Valley. So they have different chemical mixtures mm. for some of the different areas. And, some of the some of the faults like like in the Sulphur Creek area where Wilbur Hot Springs is that might bubble up or, and put in place a lot of cinnabar or or you know mercury and you can see that pressure because they drilled a geothermal test well above Wilbur Springs the Jones Fountain of Life and they can't they can't cap it it's just bubbling out and it brings out a lot of of, of well it yeah it is a lot a significant source of of mercury in, in the upper watershed that drains and half of the half of the mercury that goes into the Sacramento River comes out of the Cash Creek watershed. Half of that stops in the settling basin and the rest goes into the delta. So mm. don't eat too many big fish. <laughs> and that uh, Wilbur Springs that uh, Bob mentioned, there's an aquatic uh, uh, invertebrate that's only been found in that one spring and uh, the numerous springs that uh, Andrew's talked about, uh, most of them have never really been adequately uh, surveyed. There may well be many more uh, species only associated with one particular spring because there's so mm -hmm. such variety in the mineralogy and the uh, water chemistry of these springs that uh, the opportunity for diversity is really, really high. Yeah, it's the uniqueness of the area, right? There's because of the different geology, and I'm not a scientist, I'm the policy person, just so you guys know, just the uniqueness of the geology and the soils lead to so many different habitats and then different types of plants, um, communities and stuff that it's just amazing. And, you know, I, I we are so lucky in ways because it's such an untrammeled place compared to other places that we still have these different vibrant communities. You walk across Walker Ridge and you're walking across different geological plates as you're walking across it. I mean, how many places in the world can you do stuff like that? It's just fascinating. Not many. Well, I know too. 
there's the Mariana Trench, but you need a submarine. <laughs> there's Afghanistan, but you need a bulletproof vest. So, yeah. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> That's quoting Eldridge Moores. I like that. So doesn't anybody like, I'm, I'm a policy monk, so everybody understands where we're going on the policy. Everybody who hasn't, I'll, I'll do an ask here. Listen, we have on the bill right now, it's Garamendi and Thompson. We have Matsui, um, Huffman and Porter. If you guys are in places where your um, representatives have co-sponsored the bill, write them a note saying thank you. Write Thompson and Garamendi a note, Feinstein and Padilla one. And if you're somewhere where your representatives have not co-sponsored, tell them they should. And if you want information, go to our website. We have draft um, language up there for folks if they want to use it. But let's let people know it's important that we all feel strongly about this. And the more support we get, the faster things, right? David, I think if we get an avalanche of support, maybe we get a markup and we get it out of the house faster, which means, you know. Yeah, I mean, there'll, there will be a markup of bills in the House Natural Resources Committee that have received hearings at some point in the next few months. I think what would help build the case for that is for, and this is something Tuliomi and CLF and others are working on, is getting as many California Democrats as co-sponsors, and specifically the California Democrats who are on the committee. So um, off the top of my head, it's uh, Mr. Levin, Mr. Lowenthal, uh, Ms. Napolitano, Mr. Costa, I think of the others. Yep. David, there's another interesting twist in this thinking forward. Um, I mean, right now, the, the Calusa side of Calusa, uh, of the Condor Ridge is actually in Garamendi's district. With redistricting, that area is going to end up in the Lamalfa's district. So it's probably a good time to really pressure the administration to take action while this is part of John Garamendi's district. So that's your job. I will take on that assignment. Uh, <laughs> but it's an important point because that, you know, that that kind of lends itself to, to Craig's question earlier about kind of the the political dynamics behind how and when decisions are made, right? So, um, you know, at some level, if if there's a change in uh, political leadership in Congress, then the administration might not care who's representing that district. Yep. Um, but, it, you know, at the same time, they would always, I think, prefer to not have controversy if they can avoid it. So we need a groundswell support. Yeah. Groundswell and support. as many California members. Yeah co-sponsoring, it, it, it helps. The bill will still get a markup regardless because it it has clear support from the majority on that committee, um, but it definitely doesn't hurt to have more co-sponsors. And, and it's a way of, you know, I, I spent 15 years in DC and I worked- Oh shoot, I gotta go. Is it six? No, my thing's not till seven, sorry. You're okay. Sorry, I, forgot. <laughs> I have a seven o'clock appointment from my fourth booster shot, so. <laughs> Um, it's, it's always nice to, you know, appreciate the folks that are doing the right thing, right? It's always easy for folks to get beat up when they're doing the wrong thing. So thank, thank your folks that are doing the right things. And, you know, it is true, the people on the resources committee, folks that supported the original legislation for the um, National Conservation Area, those guys are priorities. But, you know, even if you're not in those, it's, it's important for California to support this as a whole. So... Come on, you guys. I know these people on the call. There have got to be some questions. Well, and just to a finer point for, for what you said, Sandy, you can mm -hmm. never thank members of Congress enough and reinforce the value of them doing things like this, especially now where, um, you know, even at the staff level, like I know Sandy interacts with some of the staff. It's um, a trying time to do work in Washington, frankly, regardless of who you work for and even what party you represent. Mm -hmm. and so for them to know that their work is valued is an important piece of building relationships and reinforcing um, not only the value of this campaign, but frankly, there are going to be other campaigns that you're going to want to work with these people on even when this is completed. And building those relationships, uh, like probably most other relationships in your life, comes with 
uh, praising people when they do things you like. Yeah. Speaking of relationships, uh, we had a group that has been very helpful come up uh, from all over California, Old Broads for Wilderness uh, on Sunday. And uh, they did a tremendous job uh, supporting, uh, protecting, protecting the ridge and expanding the monument. So they really deserve uh, a lot of thanks for setting that up. The, the organizer came all the way up from Riverside County to protect the ridge. One of the things that's really great about this campaign is the partnerships that we have. So we have David from Conservation Lands Foundation here, and he, they're one of our strongest partners. We've worked very closely with the Yocha Dihi, Winton Nation, Cal Wild, California Native Plant Society, Sierra Club, Defenders, um, Great Old Broads for Wilderness. Um, I know I'm forgetting somebody I shouldn't forget here, I'm sure. We've, we, um, Tuliomi is a landowner. In addition to doing our advocacy and educational and stewardship work, we abut Walker Ridge. We've worked with other landowners in the re region, the Wilbur Hot Springs landowners. They are supportive of protecting the ridge. We're working with them on um, landscape scale, stewardship planning on their properties, and hopefully um, transferring some of this things we learned from theirs onto our properties. So there's, I mean, the support for this and the coalition working on it goes from, you know, individuals in the communities, the elected representatives, the landowners in the area, the conservation groups, we have the off-road vehicle folks are supportive, right? So it's, it's the coalition that we're working with that really makes it happen. And that shows so many reasons why this should be protected. Been a long time, Bob. With twenty years or so that we've been doing this. I don't know. You were back with a baby back then. <laughs> well, the thing about this campaign, and I want to be respectful. We're getting close to six thirty hour. If anybody has any questions, we really do have. I think we we have all the elements to make this happen. We have all the elements to make it happen quickly if we continue to do it the right way, as we have been in the coalition effort we've been working with. And we also um, have, we can make this a model nationwide. So the co-management language, it's not just new for California, it's historical nationwide. It is the first time in legislation, it requires the agencies to co-manage if a federally recognized tribe requests it. It's only federally recognized because it can't impact state recognized tribes or not recognized tribes. So, but it, if the tribe requests it, the agencies must co-management with. And my understanding is they've already started conversations about like, so what would you want to be involved in? What type of planning? So all the stuff, like I think Andrew and Bob and David have all said, you know, and Glenn to a certain extent, there's all these reasons about expanding the monument, protecting Walker Ridge and Condor Ridge, Mohawk Loyuk, all that. And on top of that, we are creating a historic precedent for how to manage public lands with the native tribes and the first peoples and to use the knowledge and the stewardships they have and respect those relationships. So it's, there's so many different ways in which this legislation is amazing. So I'm, I feel really lucky to be working on it. The, I introduced the Yochadihi to the new owners and the owners there, the Yochadihi said, what can we do for you? And the owners were like, what can we do for you? And there was this conversation and realizing, you know, listening to it sometimes it impacts you just how sacred these lands are and how little control they have over how these places that mean so much to them are used and stuff and how we can actually work together to change that and make it different yeah it's yeah there's definitely a shift that's that's occurred and, and I want to say even in the last 20 years uh, toward this different ethos and, and it's refreshing. I've also gained a lot of respect. I, I've been doing this work for five years now um, and I in many different campaigns I've, I've really learned to respect and understand how forgiving many tribal communities are that they're even willing to trust people uh, after hundreds of years of not only being treated uh, poorly to that's not giving it nearly enough yeah, credit to say the least um, yeah but 
often lied to by the U.S. governments and by local governments. And so the idea, you know, that when I've been around conversations where tribes, uh, leaders of tribes will say, you know, how, how you said, Sandy, how, you know, I said, what can we do for you? The fact that they're even willing to do that to me is profound yeah. because it would be understandable if they were not willing to. And the size of their landscape relative to many of the other First Nations in North America is, is actually pretty small. So they have a really intense association with the ridge and the landscape around where they've, they've lived from time immemorial. So the fact that we can work with them and they want to work to preserve the ridge and nature and their lifestyle is, is really a wonderful first step. And it's great to see it. Well, that sounds like a great place to, to drop off. Okay, yeah, what more can you say after that? Yeah, after that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David, Bob, and Andrew for your time and Glenn and expertise. And um, please reach out at any time. Let us know if we can like answer any questions. Please join us in our effort to protect Malik Loyuk and expand Barry Assisto Mountain National Monument and manage it. So we're always here. Um, thanks, everybody. Enjoy your evening.